Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Ashwin Mehta, and I'm the medical director for Integrative Health at Memorial Cancer Institute in Broward County, South Florida. And a special thanks to eCancer and, the wonder, and their wonderful team for their kind invitation to speak about this subject that is incredibly timely and important in this day and age. Uh, my, the title of my presentation today is going to be Integrative Oncology Survivorship Recommendations for Sexual and Gender Minorities. So I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. My goal today is going to be to share the concepts of an integrative approach to survivorship for sexual and gender minority populations. I'm going to be describing the role of integrative medicine during cancer survivorship, and I'm going to be briefly de describing the evidence for lifestyle and behavioral methods of improving quality of life beyond a cancer diagnosis. And these will include nutrition, physical activity, sleep quality, acupuncture, mindfulness uh, for patients who are living beyond cancer. So integrative medicine is very much a consumer driven movement that has historically been known as complementary and alternative medicine. I'm going to share with you why these, this nomenclature is ab actually obsolete and outdated. We know now that many Americans, nearly 40%, use healthcare approaches developed outside mainstream Western or conventional medicine for specific conditions or overall well being. This, this population data is likely even more prevalent in other countries uh, which have rich healing traditions that date back centuries. According to the Samueli Institute and the American Hospital Association, approximately 42% of hospitals surveyed actually apply modalities that fall under the auspices of integrative medicine, which is a significant increase from just a five years earlier. However, integrative medicine has, has replaced the term complementary and alternative medicine and the reason for this is because alternative medicine refers to using a non-mainstream approach in place of conventional medicine, whereas complementary medicine uses these mainstream uses these non-mainstream approaches together with conventional medicine. Unfortunately, some patients gravitate to the use of widely promoted, disproved or unproven alternative modalities to achieve their health goals, and therefore it is incredibly important no less than mainstream cancer therapies in common use, complementary therapies must be evidence-based or lacking from evidence must at least have a rational basis. Some of the most challenging and saddening cases that we see at the Memorial Cancer Institute are those individuals who, who come in with an early stage of disease and they forego treatment, generally because of a typical mistrust of the medical establishment. And this mistrust is certainly higher in medically underserved populations. It is higher in minority populations where uh, sexual and gender minority populations may have a higher mistrust of the medical system, the medical establishment, and therefore it is incredibly important to apply these, these modalities in a very evidence-based way. So integrative medicine, has increasingly replaced the complementary and alternative medicine as the preferred term. Integrative oncology is a synthesis of mainstream treatment and complementary therapies in cancer care. Our goal is to apply non-invasive, non-pharmacologic adjuncts to mainstream treatment that improve patient strength and control the physical and emotional symptoms associated with cancer and cancer treatment. Our goal is also to provide patients with a sense of control and self-empowerment at a time when many feel vulnerable and life seems out of control. So very interestingly, complementary and alternative medicine usage has been studied in minority and medically underserved populations. This was a study done by Lorenzo Cohen and colleagues at MD Anderson Cancer Institute. And what this study found in 165 respondents, many reported a higher awareness and use of these therapies of complementary and alternative medicine. The use was highest for prayer, relaxation techniques, nutritional changes, including dietary changes and special diet, meditation, and massage. 
In general, patients' interest in using CAM was high for nearly all therapies. However, lack of adequate knowledge and cost of use were reported as deterrents to use. This is a very important study that looks at the prevalence of and factors associated with patients' non-disclosure of medically relevant information to clinicians. Why would a patient not disclose medically relevant information to their care team? This was a sample of 4,510 US adults that used the MTurk and Survey Sampling International database. They looked at self-reported non-disclosure within seven areas of medically relevant information. And between 61.4 and 81.1% of patients reported not disclosing medically relevant information. The major reasons for non-disclosure were disagreeing with the physician's recommendation, misunderstanding the physician's instruction, the other common reasons for non-disclosure, including not wanting to be judged by their physicians or their care teams, not wanting to hear how unhealthy their behaviors are, embarrassment, and not wanting the clinician to feel they are difficult patients. So one can understand that actually in minority and underserved populations, in sexual and gender minority populations, there may be even an even higher rate of non-disclosure due to this inherent mistrust that, that may exist for the medical establishment. We've all seen there on the internet, there may be information, but there may also be misinformation. And our integrative medicine team is designed to guide patients to what is evidence-based. Ultimately, our goal is to actually share with our patients where the science ends and where heavy marketing may begin on the internet. And so distinguishing between misinformation and good solid information is a really significant component of our integrative practice. The nice thing about having an integrative medicine program at a comprehensive cancer center is that we create this safe space. It's a safe harbor where patients can ask about other things that they've been trying in order to improve their overall quality of life and health in the context of living beyond cancer. That means either undergoing primary treatment or in the survivorship period. So our goal is really to apply conventional as well as non-conventional modalities together in an evidence-based way to preventatively address symptoms. It's very much a partnership between patients and clinicians. We engage mind, body, spirit, and community. We encourage our providers to model healthy lifestyles for our patients. We focus attention on lifestyle choices for prevention and maintenance of health. And we maintain that healing is always possible, even when perhaps cure may not be. This is Huang Di, the Yellow Emperor of ancient China. He wrote the canon of Chinese medicine in 2600 BC, and he's credited with creating the first healthcare system. And in his healthcare system, you would pay your provider every month, you would pay your provider a stipend. And that stipend would actually discontinue as soon as you became ill. So you would pay your doctor a monthly fee. As soon as you became sick, you would stop paying them that fee. So the, the goal was a focus on prevention, on preventative strategies in order to improve health. And that's very much what we do in our integrative program at the Memorial Cancer Institute, is we proactively engage patients with lifestyle behavioral interventions that can improve overall quality of life and their response to treatment. Now, we know that lifestyle factors play a significant role when it comes to living beyond cancer. This is a study that looked at a pooled analysis of post-diagnosis lifestyle factors and their association with late estrogen receptor positive breast cancer prognosis. And it is, it is understandable that modifiable lifestyle factors were associated with late outcomes among long-term ER positive breast cancer survivors. What were some of these factors? gain in body weight of greater than 10% compared to baseline. 
a, a body mass index of greater than 35, alcohol intake, physical inactivity, and smoking. So I'll spend just a few moments talking about how we address these questions and concerns. One of the most common questions we receive from our patients is the, uh, the question of alcohol intake. Most recent data suggests that when, when it comes to living beyond cancer, there is no amount of alcohol that is safe. So less is better and zero alcohol consumption is best. This is based on large population data that has evolved our thinking over the years. We used to say that because there was a very slight cardiovascular benefit, that moderate consumption of alcohol was acceptable. But our thinking has changed based on new data that has emerged over the past few years that actually share with us, that actually show us that there is no amount of alcohol that is safe. Smoking cessation. Typically, there are three aspects of any smoking cessation plan. But there's a biologic plan, there's a psychologic plan, and there's a social plan because smoking is a biologic, psychologic, and social addiction. And so we apply all three fronts in a smoking cessation program. The biologic plan includes medications, this can in include. Uh, bupropion, also known as the trade name Zyban, uh, we Chantix. These are all these are all uh, uh, medications that can be used in order to address the smoking, the biologic component of smoking cessation. Um, nicotine replacement therapy is also part of this this aspect of smoking cessation plan. The next aspect is the psychologic aspect. I request my patients who are smokers to calculate how much money per week they're spending on tobacco, on vaping, on any tobacco use. And I encourage them to, instead of spending that on tobacco, to actually put it into a glass container and watch that money grow over time. This is positive reinforcement for staying quick. So in addition to the biologic smoking cessation component, there is now a psychologic positive reinforcement component. Within six months of smoking cessation, most patients have enough money saved up to take a nice vacation with their families. Also setting a date is very important, a, a quit date. Usually this quit date is an anniversary, a birthday, some date that's actually very important to the patient and actually setting that as a target date. So the biologic therapies the medications and nicotine replacement begin prior to the quit date. And then on the quit date, all things that are reminding our patients of cigarettes are discarded and thrown away. This is the ashtrays, the cigarettes, the lighters, the matches, the cartons, all of these cigarettes, all the, anything that has an association with those cigarettes is thrown away. So there's a biologic plan, there's a psychologic plan, and then there's a social plan. And this social plan is equally important for medically underserved minority populations and sexual and gender minority populations. Encourage your patients to actually identify a quit partner, a quit coach. And actually in Florida, we have a wonderful tobacco free Florida program that actually will pair our patients with a quit coach so that anytime they have that craving, they're calling their quit coach on the phone and they're going for a brisk walk or doing something constructive for their health instead of going for that cigarette. So do remember that for any successful smoking cessation program, there needs to be a biologic plan, a psychologic plan, and a social plan. So we use coaching as well as multidisciplinary teams that focus on lifestyle changes to improve quality of life for our patients. Anxiety may be very prevalent in our cancer patients. It's incredibly important to address anxiety proactively and preventatively. We're very fortunate here at Memorial to have three mind-body medicine trained psychologists who exclusively work with our cancer patients in order to provide them with counseling services 
when life really may seem out of control. The nice thing about our care design at Memorial is that we proactively engage patients with the supportive infrastructure that we have, including our psychologists, nutritionists, and our integrative medicine team in order to proactively address symptoms such as anxiety in our cancer patients. Fortunately, we have guidelines to guide our recommendations of integrative modalities within cancer patients. I'll refer you to the Journal of Clinical Oncology. This is the ASCO special article looking at integrative therapies during and after breast cancer treatment. These are the ASCO endorsement of SO clinical practice guidelines. The JNCI monograph published in September of 2018 outlined clinical practice guidelines on the use of integrative therapies as supportive care in patients treated for breast cancer. These included meditation, yoga, relaxation with imagery, all which were recommended for routine use for common conditions, including anxiety and mood disorders. This received grade A evidence. Additionally, stress management techniques like yoga, massage, music therapy, and meditation were recommended for stress reduction, anxiety, depression, fatigue, and to improve quality of life. This received grade B evidence. The majority of interventions and modality combinations did not have sufficient evidence to form specific recommendations. And notably, one intervention, acetyl L-carnitine, for the prevention of toxin-induced neuropathy was identified as likely harmful given grade H as it was found to increase neuropathy. And this is precisely why it's really important to create this safe space where patients can openly disclose what kinds of things they are doing on their own to improve their quality of life. What teas are they drinking? What herbs are they taking? What vitamins and supplements may they be using? This is important in order for us to understand whether or not these modalities are safe for them to use. We also really want to place an emphasis on the potential for drug or supplement interactions, herb-drug interactions. Um, it's incredibly important to at least identify what our patients are doing so that we can guide them to a much more evidence-based approach. Every patient who comes through our door for an integrative consultation receives both a sleep screening as well as an exercise and nutrition recommendation. This study looks at the effects of physical activity behavioral changes on inflammation and related health outcomes in breast cancer survivors. This was a pilot randomized trial which showed that actually less, there was less fatigue and improved sleep quality, as well as a reduced risk of breast cancer recurrence with chronic exercise training. The mediator in this case is the decrease in chronic systemic inflammation. We use exercise to address many of the symptoms and side effects of cancer treatment and we use exercise in order to rebuild lost bone density and muscle tone that often occurs in the context of primary treatment. The other th reason that exercise is incredibly important is because oftentimes we describe how tumor cancer cells enjoy a tumor microenvironment that is acidic in nature, high in readily available sugar, cool in temperature, and low in oxygen. So these, the, all of these are addressed by a regular exercise routine. Exercise, during exercise, our recommendation to begin with is typically 30 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic exercise five days per week. And our goal is to hyperoxygenate, to increase blood flow and thereby core body temperature by about 1.5 degrees, to alkalinize the tumor microenvironment, and to reduce blood sugar in the tumor microenvironment by improving muscle tone and basal metabolic rate. So for all of these reasons, exercise is incredibly important. And these are the kinds of things that we can share to our, with our patients, especially those patients who may be living a sedentary lifestyle or may lack the motivation to really engage in an exercise routine. It's really important to describe the reasons why an exercise prescription, an exercise recommendation is so essential uh, to improve their quality of life while they're on, while they're receiving cancer treatment and as well as in the survivorship period. 
So we often treat symptom clusters. I call these kind of a constellation of symptoms because they're oftentimes interrelated. We see a lot of fatigue, weight loss and weight gain, changes in body composition, poor sleep quality, mood changes like depression and anxiety, uh, neuropathy, we see cognitive slowing, the cancer-related cognitive impairment, we, we see a lot of cancer-related pain, physical deconditioning, sexual dysfunction, and lymphedema. All of these are important to ask about in the context of the supportive care uh, that we provide for our cancer patients. Many of our interventions when it comes to integrative health is really to target the stress response. The way that we oftentimes describe this is that during the diagnostic, pro during the di diagnostic plan that so many of our cancer patients go through, there is incredible stress and incredible uncertainty that they experience. And the way that I describe it oftentimes is that our bodies kind of operate between two ends of the spectrum. On one end of the spectrum is fight and flight. This is the stress response. On the other end of the spectrum is rest and digest. This is the healing response. During the early stages of a diagnostic process, oftentimes our cancer patients, the needle gets stuck on the fight and flight end of the spectrum, the sympathetic end of the spectrum. So what often is compromised? Sleep quality as well as digestion. So we oftentimes target stress response early on in our interventions. How do we do this? Well, we have a team of nutritionists. Everyone gets an exercise prescription. We have a medical fitness program. These are not personal trainers. These are master's level exercise physiologists who work with our cancer patients to improve bone density and muscle tone and keep them uh, on, an, on, a, on an exercise routine. The way I describe exercise to my cancer patients is that if chemotherapy is the nail, exercise is the hammer. It's actually part of your treatment. We use mindfulness techniques to really build up that coping, the coping and resilience mechanisms that are so important uh, as our patients go through their cancer journeys. I'm a sleep medicine expert by training, so everyone also gets a sleep screening. We have two wonderful acupuncture practitioners. Acupuncture we use for treatment associated arthralgias, body aches, fatigue, nausea, Aromatase inhibitor associated arthralgias. These are some primary indications for which we use acupuncture. Massage can also be used effectively in order to address lymphedema, in order to uh, also improve sleep quality, particularly in those patients who are experiencing cancer related pain. We have a therapeutic yoga program. These are not yoga instructors, these are yoga therapists. So they have a much greater degree of training when it comes to applying yoga practices and postures in order to actually provide therapeutic benefit for our cancer patients. And we have a music therapy program uh, that has both group and individual uh, practices. Very important that every, every patient whom we see gets a nutritional recommendation. This is a study that looks at low fat dietary pattern and long-term breast cancer incidence and mortality. This is data from the Women's Health Initiative and its randomized clinical trial. And what they concluded was that the adoption of a low fat dietary pattern was associated with increased vegetable, fruit, and grain intake. It demonstrably achievable by many, significantly reduced the risk of death from breast cancer in postmenopausal women. So, actual improvement in prognosis with a plant based nutritional approach, what we refer to as a Mediterranean lifestyle, a mixture between Mediterranean and Asian cuisine, and mostly plant-based, not completely vegetarian, but predominantly plant-based, low in processed foods, low in fried foods, and particularly low in animal proteins. Other nutritional risk reduction strategies that we use is encouraging cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, asparagus, Brussels sprouts, cabbage. These foods are high in compounds known as indole. Uh, these, these foods are high in antioxidants, including indole-3-carbonyl, 
inositol, hexaphosphate, uh, Asian mushrooms. We encourage Asian mushrooms significantly in our practice. Uh, the more exotic they sound, typically, the more of an immunomodulatory effect that they have. These include maitake, shiitake, reishi, lion's mane, turkey tail, chagas. All of these mushrooms have wonderful immunomodulatory properties. We use curcuminoids, such as those that exist in turmeric and ginger. We oftentimes recommend things like ginger tea to proactively address nausea in patients who are experiencing uh, nausea during chemotherapy. We also advocate for green tea. Uh, green tea is particularly high in antioxidants. One of those antioxidants is EGCG, or epigallo epigallocatechin gallate 3. We aggressively replenish vitamin D levels. The reason for this is because vitamin D deficiency is associated with about a dozen different types of cancers. And it's incredibly important to address these nutritional uh, aspects especially in, in medically underserved populations, as well as sexual and gender minority populations. So the benefits of a plant-based diet are rather, uh, are rather apparent to us. This was a study done by a friend and colleague named Dr. Robert Thomas in the UK. What he did was a double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized trial evaluating the effect of a polyphenol-rich whole food supplement on PSA progression in men with prostate cancer. And what they found was that this compound, which included pomegranate, green tea, broccoli, and turmeric, actually demonstrated a statistically significant lower rise in PSA progression in those men who were adopting a surveillance approach for prostate cancer. Interestingly enough, we're finding that the microbiome not only exists within the digestive tract, but that other organ tissues, other organ systems of the body may have their own microbiome. This is a wonderful study. There was a collaboration between Irish and Canadian researchers that looked at the microbiome of breast tissue and its association with breast cancer. Interestingly, a diverse population of bacteria can be found within breast tissue. And this diversity is, is present irrespective of a history of lactation. In this study of 81 women, the most abundant phylum in the healthy breast microbiome was proteobacteria. Women with breast cancer have a higher abundance of enterobacteria, staphylococcus, and bacillus when compared to women without breast cancer. So interestingly enough, these inflammation-producing bacteria within the breast microbiome is, are actually associated with a higher incidence of cancer. Limiting consumption of red meat, also very, very important. It's very, it's, it's, it's essential to be very mindful of cultural practices when making our nutritional recommendations. However, we can see that from large population data, this was colon cancer incidence in 100,000 women, and looking at those countries with the highest red meat consumption, New Zealand, USA, Canada, UK, Denmark. These countries also had the highest incidence of colon can cancer. So you see there's an association between per capita daily meat consumption and colon cancer incidence in this cohort of 100,000 women. We also used yoga breathing. Yoga breathing is a wonderful way of improving quality of life for patients who are living beyond cancer. This was a great study done at the University of California, San Francisco, looking at how yoga breathing for cancer chemotherapy associated symptoms and quality of life. We practice yoga breathing with many of our patients and prescribe yoga breathing uh, very routinely during our integrative consultations. The process of the practice of engaging in yoga breathing actually improves accessory respiratory muscle strength and muscle tone. And it, it makes people more, it makes us more mindful of our posture. It's impossible to take deep breaths when our posture is slunched over. 
a good posture actually allows us to take deeper, more restorative breaths. So yoga breathing is a wonderful way of improving our posture, improving quality of life, and the mediator or the way it achieves this is by strengthening those accessory respiratory muscles and providing areas with rich oxygenated blood flow. Look at the exponential rise in research studies that have looked at mindfulness over the past several years. We know that there's a mind-body connection and this study done in the University of South Florida shows us that there is a significant impact of a mindfulness practice in, in people who are living beyond cancer. The study looked at the influence of mindfulness-based stress reduction on telomerase activity in women with breast cancer. This is a randomized controlled trial, relatively small number of patients, 142 breast cancer patients with between stage zero and three breast cancer, and looking at the survivorship period after primary treatment. Six weekly two-hour sessions that included education related to mindfulness, the collective practice of meditation, addressing barriers to regular practice, using body scan, yoga, walking meditation. What they found was that in the treatment intervention, in the intervention group, there was increased telomerase activity in the meditation group, real tangible evidence of the mind-body connection. Mindfulness is really uh, applicable to everybody. So in conclusion, it's incredibly important to use an integrative approach in patients who are living beyond cancer, especially in the survivorship period. Those patients who are medically underserved, who are sexual and, min and gender minority patients, who may have a general mistrust of healthcare and physicians in general. It's incredibly important to engage them, to empower them with what's in the latest science. Having an integrative approach allows us to do this and to really, and really improve quality of life using all of these non-pharmacologic, non-invasive techniques that include good sleep practices, nutritional recommendations, an exercise prescription, and mindfulness techniques, in addition to therapeutic yoga, acupuncture, and all of these other methods that I've shared with you today. Thank you so much for your attention. I really look forward to our dialogue and upcoming questions.